The Now Show! Well, this is it. The first Now Show of the last year of the second millennium. And how things have changed since our last series. When we left you in December, our armed forces were dropping bombs on a recalcitrant dictator and General Pinochet was awaiting a ruling on his extradition. Now, however, by contrast, our armed forces are dropping bombs on a recalcitrant dictator and General Pinochet is awaiting a ruling on his extradition. But that was then. And this is now. Uh, by the way, for those of you who have missed the other major news stories of the past three months, here is a quick rundown. And so we proudly launch the Euro. <laughs> Auf de Villa, Auf de Villa. Mr. President, you've been equipped. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll come back later. <laughs> uh, genetically modified food is uh, it's perfectly safe. <laughs> It's ten o'clock, time for some disguised pornography. <laughs> the news is, um, oh, it's on later. <laughs> down the villa, down the villa. Uh, if you'll just hand over your weapons, uh, we need them quite badly. Um, <laughs> to use in Serbia. <laughs> oh, they were way ahead of you there, Tony. <laughs> now, please welcome Busman and Quantic. There's a new sociological group in town, and he's parked in the bus lane. Yes, after yuppies, buppies and puppies comes White Van Man. White Van Man doesn't sound like an abbreviation, but it is. His full name is White Van Stupid Cockney, very behind on the child maintenance payments, wearing paint spatter clothes, even though he isn't a painter, man. White Van Man, easily spotted because he drives a white van, and he's a man, has been given his own van but he doesn't actually own it, so he drives like a psychopath. <laughs> now, White Van Man has been given his own newspaper column in The Sun, but he doesn't actually write it, so he talks like a psychopath. Kosovo? Well, it's your West Indians, isn't it? Eh? It's your... Well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Driving round the centre of town at 60 miles an hour for no apparent reason, with Clean Me written in the filth on the side of his vehicle, <laughs> White Van Man has a distinctive call. Oi, mate! Oi, you want to buy some speakers? I bought six too many. They're not stolen or nothing. Are they? Well, all right, they are. <laughs> and a distinctive mating cry. Oi, darling, do your legs go all the way up? Let's have intercourse. <laughs> White Van Man is the sworn enemy of nearly all other road users. He despises bus-using man, road-crossing boy, and enormous Volvo picking the kids up from schoolwoman. And he hopes to one day run over and kill Guardian-reading vegetarian mountain bike man. His ambition is to one day be Black Cab Man. Um, Oxford Street, please. All right, darling. Here, do you want to buy some speakers? No. All right, darling. How was I to know you was a lesbian? <laughs> Of course, soon Tony Blair will do his usual trick of backing whatever's popular on the right, whether it's law and order, global nuclear war, or wearing boxer shorts back to front. And he'll come out in favour of white van man. And we have a solution. Put the white van men and their white vans in a big plane and drop them on Serbia. <laughs> causing Slobodan Milosevic to spend all his money on speakers and go bankrupt. <laughs> it's a stupid idea, but it might just work. Pont and Dennis. Well, according to my diary and my fairly vague understanding of biology, now is the time to start trying to conceive a millennium baby. Apparently all the clubs and pubs will be empty and the night air silent, save for the sound of creaking bed springs, as thousands of couples who've starved themselves of sex for months so as to avoid the horror of having a baby with a 20th century registration plate <laughs> go conception crazy. The aim? To have the first baby of the year 2000. Yes, what a wise choice that would be. Having a baby just after midnight on January the 1st of next year. <laughs> when in the spirit of the Millennial New Year, taxi drivers will charge 2,000 times as much as normal to take you to the hospital. When all the heart monitors, life support machines and computers will crash mid-birth thanks to the bug. And when everyone else will be enjoying the biggest New Year's Eve since 9.99. Excuse me. Excuse me. My wife is about to give birth. Could you direct us to a doctor? That's me! <laughs> Frankly, the whole idea of trying to produce the first baby of the millennium is a horrible one. I mean, giving birth should not be a horse race. 
Well, all the mothers are fully dilated, and now they're off, and the first to show is Audrey Simpson from Lowestoft. She's ahead by a short head, a rather short and misshapen head, but I'm sure it will sort itself out. But here comes Julie Capstick. She's really spread her legs, and as we come up to the second minute mark, is Audrey Simpson, followed by Julie Capstick, who's just a torso ahead of Mrs. Davis and Ponty Brief, with Pam Scruton bringing up the rear to a rather more comfortable position. Well, they all seem to have settled into a rhythm now. Oh, no, I spoke too soon. Audrey Simpson has lost her stirrups, but she's still reached the six-inch mark with no obvious competition, but Julie Capstick has gone for the forceps, and she's gaining quickly, and as we approach the finish line. It's Audrey Simpson with Judy Capstick in second, but Mrs. Davis is putting in a tremendous challenge for this final leg of the race, and it's Mrs. Simpson. The baby is clear. The court is cut, and the race is hers. With Audrey Simpson second, Capstick third, and Pam Scruton never really in it. Well, that's the big race over, but we're still one more left. Join us after the break for the placenta. <laughs> the Mao Show. And now, Open University Biology Foundation course, Module 1. Over to Dan and Nick. Let's have a look at the food chain, people. Who's at the top? Why, it's man. Hello! Next on the list are the birds and the bees. And just below them are the fleas. But who's at the bottom of the food chain? Who did evolution forget? A species of blob without a brain. They're the guests on Jerry Springer. Hi, I'm Chip. <laughs> the species is easily identified. His hair is cut with a bow. Except for some straggly bits at the back. I keep them because they make me look cool. <laughs> Mongolia, what do you want to say to Chet? I'm a lesbian, and I'm also your Uncle Dwight. <laughs> Help me out here, Chet. I need five million bucks. Would you mind starting a fight? Not all my partners are his family. Some of them was my cousins. I can count them on the fingers of one hand, which means that I've had dozens. I guess I'm Jerry Springer. The thinking is a model. They are a unique animal, cause the gene pool is a puddle. You know... My guests may not be beautiful or have any brains. It stipulates that in their contract. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, from the pubs, the snugs and the saloon bars of the nation, please hail the King of Beers, the pub landlord, Mr. Al Murray! Yeah. Let's hear it for the beer! Yeah. To the aisle! Yay! And welcome the wine for the ladies. <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful audience. I notice we've got a young lad down here at the front. How old are you, son? Thirteen. Thirteen, huh? Five more years, mate. <laughs> <laughs> By rights, you should be in the beer garden with the other children. Hmm? <laughs> a bottle of hooch. Now! <laughs> now! Have we got anyone here who works in computers tonight? Anyone who's in the IT business? The gentleman there getting nudged by his son with the tie and the glasses. Hmm? Which, branch, which branch of PC World do you work in, sir? After sales. After sales? Fantastic. Well done, eh? Yeah. You probably like that virtual reality, don't you? Eh? Of course you do. How can it be reality, mate, if it's virtual? You haven't thought it through, have you, pal? <laughs> virtual is a £40 word for the £10 word not, isn't it? <laughs> if it's virtual, then it isn't reality, is it, mate? You're going, I'm in space! I'm in space! You're not. You're in an arcade with two tellies strapped to your head. <laughs> you haven't thought it through, have you, mate? Now, now, no, seriously, right? Because it's this millennium bug, right? Now, I'm her holding you personally responsible for this, mate. Right? Right? It's your mob, right? Fail to remember that next year is the year 2000. Now, if anyone, any one year ever represented the future, it was the year 2000. It's a silver-haired lady there who never thought she'd see the year 2000. <laughs> You're unimaginably close to that year now, aren't you, love? Hey, yeah, back in the 50s, you never imagined it, did you? <laughs> You'd make it into the time when we'd all be wearing silver foil and eating pills and living on the moon. Now, <laughs> the year 2000 was the future. Not just the future, but the future. <laughs> now, computers, of course, mate, they're the machines of the future, aren't they? The machines of the future. Now, the people actually designing the machines of the future <laughs> failed to consider the actual arrival of the future, didn't they? <laughs> What's your name, sir, the computer working man? Uh, the real 
your, your actual name, son. <laughs> What's his name, son? Tell me. Dad. Good answer. <laughs> What's your name, mate? Ben. Nice try. I know a Jeremy when I see one. <laughs> Now, I want you all to make me a promise tonight, because you're beautiful people. Whatever you do, January the 1st, the year 2000, do not get in an aeroplane. Promise me that. <laughs> huh? Jeremy, you can do what you like. Read what you say. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Whatever you do, don't get in an aeroplane January the 1st, year 2000, because because of the millennium bug, huh? the clock in the computer on the aeroplane, instead of going to January 1st, year 2000, we've got to January 1st, 1900. <laughs> Before flying was invented. <laughs> Computer will get confused. What am I doing in the sky? <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Try and turn itself into a boat, the main means of transport in 1900, and land in the sea, and it'll, it'll be in your graves before you know it. Now, and I want the lady to see the year 2000. It'd be beautiful <laughs> if she could. It's an unimagined future for someone from the 50s. Now... I've got to be on my way now. Um, I'm going to tell you a little more about what sort of aeroplane you need to be getting into on January 1st, year 2000. So, in the meantime, please take your glasses. Back to the bar. Cheers. Thank you. Dan and Nick's Guide to Jeans. Jeans were invented in the 19th century. Until then, organisms reproduced using pantaloons. <laughs> Genes were discovered in plants by Gregor Mendel. He couldn't decide which plant to use for his experiments, so in the end, he went for a pea. <laughs> Genes are found in chromosomes, but what are chromosomes? The word comes from the Latin chrome, meaning shiny metal, and somes, meaning fat politician. <laughs> Everyone's chromosomes are different. Men have the Y chromosome. Women have the because-I've-got-a-headache chromosome. <laughs> And the X chromosome has still got all my CDs. One of the most shattering scientific breakthroughs of the 20th century came when the structure of DNA was elucidated by Holmes and Watson and Crick. Ah, Crick. Yes, Watson? Crick, you're a pain in the neck. Ah! Ah, Holmes! Watson, I've just got this. What is it? Dear stalker, please stop stalking me, yours, etc. Must be a letter. <laughs> really, Holmes? Yes, I'm afraid I've made rather an exhibition of myself. Ideal, Holmes. <laughs> we've, we've hit a snag in our research. We can't determine how citrus fruits reproduce. It's a lemon entry, my dear Watson. <laughs> The genetic material from the parents is combined in the act of fertilization. Though millions of sperm may be released, only one will get through to the egg. Hello, is that the egg? No, she's out. <laughs> fertilization is, of course, not as easy as it looks on TV. This has led to the proliferation of sperm banks. I'd like to make a deposit, please. I'm glad you came. And how did you get here? My chew. <laughs> now, look, um, can you tell me, uh, how do I get into my wife's deposit box? Well, <laughs> that's a question we've all been asking for millennia. The Now Show. Now, since we were last on the air, it has been discovered that all television is fake. Yes, all even wildlife programmes. There was one on, on Sunday night called Violent Planet about a hurricane hitting Costa Rica. And at the end, a caption came up saying, some of the animal footage has been faked. How? Is there an agency that supplies bedraggled animals to order? I mean, I did think the transsexual turtle scuttling up the beach going, oh my God, it's so windy, <laughs> did look a bit dodgy. And that followed the scene where two basking sharks were reintroduced to each other in a section called, we only met to mate. <laughs> The trouble is, of course, that a couple of bad apples have spoilt the whole barrel and you don't believe anything you see on television anymore. There was a bit in Violent Planet of a bird clinging miserably inside a tree trunk during a hurricane while the tree swayed and creaked. And if you thought about it for a split second, you thought, hang on, 
So this cameraman has climbed a tree in the middle of a hundred mile an hour wind and is hanging there filming a fed up bird? I think not. <laughs> I think somewhere in a studio there's a director going action tree and wind machine and action bird, more fed up love, look really depressed, it's a really big storm, you're really fed up, your tree might fall over any minute, no cut, cut, we'll go again, this time think of Bernard Matthews. <laughs> Of course, the idea of fake television has changed. In the 1970s, everybody wanted fake television. A television that looked like an antique cabinet or folded away neatly into a genuine veneered mock Chippendale corner cupboard. No one wanted a television that looked like a television because that was thought to be lower class and watching it was lowbrow. Nowadays, the idea of disguising large electrical items as handcrafted pieces of furniture has transferred itself to the kitchen, although it does depend on the item. Dishwashers, for some reason, are quite often hidden behind a mock Georgian trompe l'oeil facade. Why? The only thing that isn't encased in wood is the oven, which is lucky. Oh, here's the cooker. We've put it in the wardrobe. <laughs> uh, get the fire extinguisher, will you? <laughs> this week, a book claimed the moon landings were faked. There are people who think Shakespeare is faked, the Holocaust was faked, and even that the Earth being round is faked. Interestingly, though, these people all believe that David Ginola goes down in the penalty area absolutely for real. <laughs> The problem is, not so much that stuff that's meant to be real is now being faked, it's that the stuff that used to be faked, drama and sitcoms, too expensive, and it's been replaced by docu-soap, which is supposed to be real. So the stuff that's fake is real, and the stuff that's real is fake. Except, of course, the stuff that's real is fake real, but the stuff that's fake is really fake, none of which would matter were we not at war. <laughs> it was the world's defence ministries who virtually invented fake TV. They live so much in their own little world, they have no idea that modern TV viewers are a bit sophisticated. I don't know what normal Serbian television is like, but my guess is that if the BBC showed nothing but British soldiers training, marching and singing patriotic music, the British would think, hello, obviously total disaster has occurred. <laughs> but apparently over there it's really reassuring. When the Serbs shot down the self bomber, it was all over the TV. There were people standing on it, pointing at it and going berserk. There must have been a few Serbian viewers going, hang on, how come we didn't see any of the other 86 planes we're supposed to have shot down? <laughs> Serbian newsreader. And our forces have shot down another NATO plane. Here it is. There it was. I hope you didn't miss it. Viewers going, that was an airfix Wellington, wasn't it? <laughs> Quite embarrassing losing a stealth bomber. The stealth operates on the principle that its design reduces its radar image to that of a large bird, therefore making it impossible for it to be shot down by Serbian ground-to-air missiles, except, presumably, if they aim those missiles at things which look like large birds. <laughs> large birds which seem to be heading directly for their military installations. <laughs> also, it seems a bit rough on genuine large birds. Yeah. It's not a good time to be a Yugoslavian duck. Incredible to think that for years the world trembled through a Cold War based on the notion that modern military hardware was so technologically sophisticated that warfare was unthinkable. Now we find that all along the technology seems to be not quite as impressive as previously thought. Our raids on Serbia have been much reduced by one factor the planners had not foreseen. Cloud. <laughs> yes, one of the last things you'd expect to encounter in the sky over Europe. <laughs> We have millions and millions of pounds worth of RAF Harriers sitting on the ground because it's cloudy. I mean, Monarch Airlines can get you to Lanzarote when it's cloudy. The RAF can't drop a few basic bombs. Uh, we apologise for the delays of this bombing raid. It's been caused by cloud. Uh, we will be launching our missiles from our warships as soon as the sea gets a bit less choppy. Thank you. Busman and Quanti. There are now more women in the media than ever before. Sorry, that should have been. There are now more women in the media with their clothes on than ever before. <laughs> There's a new breed of tabloid columnist. She's fearless, she's forthright, and she always speaks her mind. That Kosovo. Men, eh? Can't live with them, can't ask for equal pay because they'll send me back to the horoscope page. Posh Spice has put on weight! Serves a right for being happy, the slut. Then there are the quality newspaper columnists. Kosovo illustrates the dangers of a patriarchal defence policy. Men, can't live with them, can't ask for equal pay because they'll send me back to interviewing Martin Amis. Posh Spice has put on weight, whore. <laughs> Accidentally turn on the TV during the hours of daylight and chances are you'll see a woman's face these days. 98% of that face is Judy Finnegan, wishing that those 14 years with Richard Madeley were just a horrible dream. <laughs> but the other 2% is the new financially independent woman. She's young and cockney. Have you got an overdraft? Big spots? 
A drug problem. Cool. <laughs> She's young and pregnant. <laughs> My Charlotte's 18 months, and I have to check her nappy two or three times a day because I just love the smell of poo. <laughs> She's young, and then she's 50. Are you over 50? Have you thought about a conservatory? What about a pension? No? Oh, never mind. You'll soon be dead. <laughs> the most offensive of all is Bridget Jones. She really is a stupid cow. <laughs> oh, cigarettes, 10. Calories, 200. Books sold, 10 million. <laughs> For some reason, Bridget Jones has been such a hit that there are rip-offs everywhere. Boris Yeltsin's diary. Calories, 160. Cigarettes, 4. Alcohol units, 10 billion. <laughs> Slobodan hasn't called since Tuesday. I think he's playing hard to get. Following the success of last week's comedy night, we tonight have got four comedians for the price of one. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for status quo. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. Here's one of our new albums. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice trousers, Francis. New cords. You must be joking, mate. <laughs> How much did they cost you? Twenty notes. Twenty notes? You're frightening me. <laughs> right, everybody, here's one you might remember. <laughs> Oi, landlord, the lock in our dressing room doesn't work. Do you want the key changed? Watch, Watch it. it. <laughs> oh, Francis, I, I'm sick of long hair and tight jeans. Oh, you've changed your tune. No, I haven't. <laughs> oh, 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 I've got, got cramp. Crap me what? arm. No. Ah. Oh! No. Oh, no. Mate, get it together, get it together. Okay, hang on, get no. it. Yeah. That's oh. better, that's better. <laughs> Oh, oh, it's awesome. Oh, it's happening again! No! Oh, oh, dear. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, back to the pub landlord, Mr Al Murray. Cheers, see you. Yeah. So anyway, I've got, I got myself a solution to all this millennium buggery, right? If... <laughs> If you're going to get in an aeroplane January the 1st, year 2000, please be sure you get in an aircraft you can trust. Yeah? Yeah? Say a Spitfire. That's right. <laughs> we didn't let us down in the 40s, won't let us down in the year 2000. <laughs> they weren't built with the future in mind, were they? No, they were built with the Germans in mind. As a result, they're reliable. Now, the point is this. Any aircraft, in fact, Spitfire, anything with a propeller on the front. Yeah? Because you can see how an aircraft with a propeller on the front works, can't you? It's all up front, it's obvious, right? The propeller is a great big blade on the front of the aeroplane. Spinning blade cuts a hole in the sky through which the rest of the aircraft then slides. <laughs> Physics, isn't it? Stands to reason. <laughs> Jets, no visible means of propulsion. Yeah? Four giant whistles on a wing. It's nonsense. <laughs> it's trickery of some kind. Now, I think for the millennium, to celebrate the millennium, what we shouldn't do is be having this giant dis tent on a disused gas works. That is a £40 solution to a £10 problem. What we should be doing <laughs> is getting these old aircraft, dusting them off and attacking the Thames barrier for old time's sake. <laughs> Flood Peckham! Show the world we've still got it, yeah? Build a new bouncing bomb. <laughs> Because that's pretty stinking at its finest, a bouncing bomb, isn't it? Yeah, because plenty of people have made things that bounce, haven't they? I'm sure even the Dutch have made things that bounce. Pe plenty of people have made things that blow up, bombs. But only the British have put the two together <laughs> to come up with a bouncing bomb. It's brilliant, isn't it? Hey? <laughs> that's British thinking, don't it? Taking two things and combining them. Yeah? Separate 
ingredients and combining them, coming up with something new. Yeah? For instance, this glass I'm holding my hand, this pint glass here, was made in France. <laughs> <laughs> the beer therein was brewed in Germany. <laughs> Put them together, what you got? Hey, a great British pint. <laughs> what could be finer? Hey, pint for the fella, glass of white wine or fruit-based drink for the lady. <laughs> Those are the rules. Please take your glasses back to the bar. Cheers, thank you very much. The Now Show. Oh, well, that's just about it for this week. But uh, finally, uh, we asked our studio audience this week um, if they could play an April Fool on anybody, anywhere, what would they do? And um, a, few, uh, a few fine suggestions have flooded in. Yeah, I've got uh, one from Jane. Um, what would you do? Chris Tarrant. I would take out his brain, if I can find it, and, and feed it to my cat. <laughs> and why? <laughs> because the cat gets very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and would enjoy... And would enjoy a light snack. <laughs> I struggle to find the April Fool element in there, but, but still. Um, this is a bit of a cruel one from Peter. Is, uh, if you could play an April Fool on anyone anywhere, what would you do? I would tell David Beckham that the baby should have been called South End Pier. <laughs> Why? Because he would believe it. <laughs> That's very cruel, Peter. <laughs> so I've got Daniel. I would announce that Shula Archer is to die in a terrible threshing machine accident. Why? It's kind of fun to think about it. <laughs> this is a tremendous one. It's from Agatha. What would you do? I would lower everyone's ceiling by two inches. Why? To make them think they were growing abnormally. <laughs> I think with that, that's all from this week. Thank you very much to our studio audience and to our listeners at home. Uh, thank you very much indeed and good night. The Now Show was hosted by Steve Hunt and Hugh Dennis and was brought to you by Jane Busman, Emma Clark, Dan Friedman, Al Murray, David Quantic and Nick Romero. It was developed by Bill Dare with the producer Aled Evans. <laughs>